You know, the lighting is not that great. I don't know how bad it is and I won't know until post pro, so don't come for me. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. As you can tell, today we're discussing Atlanta season one, episode two, Streets on Lock. What a perfect name. I feel like I mentioned the name of episode one when we did the review last week. That one was called The Big Bang. Perfect name to kick off a series since they haven't had any chill since the start. This episode opens up with Al and Ern kikiing about their experiences on the way to the holding center where they're at. Paperboy's police officer kept asking, are you okay, while he was driving him there, whereas Ern's was trying to get him to snake Paperboy. And then he was like, oh, I should have gotten rid of the weed. And he says something to Al about, oh, well, you've been in here for weed, so it's not that bad. It's my first time here. And Al's like, I would have rather not gone to jail for weed. And I'm thinking the same thing. Like, sometimes I feel like Ern is so oblivious to things. He just says it and doesn't realize how ridiculous it sounds. They keep making jokes. And at one point, Paper Boy is called and he's released. He asks the lady, what about my cousin? He says, this is not a movie. One thing I love about Atlanta is they break the fourth wall without the cheesy character turning to the screen to let us know they're breaking the fourth wall. Unless you're talking season three, episode nine. That's the only time they've ever done it. This is where the storylines split and we're going to talk about Al's and Darius's plot line first and we'll go back to Earn after. So Al's leaving, but just before he goes, one of the correctional officers runs up on him and says, hey, can we get a picture? This guy was too comfortable letting Paperboy know that he lost locked up another rapper and I just said mm. when Al said I hate this place I felt that him and Darius go to their local spot to get food and this made me think about the question from episode 9 of season 3 where do you take your cousin when they get out of jail because I don't got an answer for that I don't have any cousins in jail but whatever that spot was it was the spot they were complaining about waiting so long Darius tells Al well we could have sat here and it'd probably be quicker He's stacking things and I can't see what it is at first, but when it tumbles, I realize he's stacking salt and pepper shakers. But as they're conversing, Al says something that really stands out to me now that went over my head back then, which is I don't like to eat out. It's like being at a zoo. When I first heard that years ago, I just thought it was one of those strange things like Atlanta always Atlanta's just that show where there's always strange things said, but now looking back and also learning some things from people in real life, that is a very, very important statement on two levels. The first, a lot of people who've been to jail have this complex where they don't like eating around people because it's not safe. It's very dangerous. Two, it also speaks to this fragility of the ego. You would think someone like Paperboy won't care if he's out eating, but Everyone has things that they're insecure about. It's very interesting that ever so often with this character, they slip in something that has you thinking, hmm, a person like this is thinking like that? After what seems like a short time to us, but forever to them, the server comes out with the order and he put a little extra sauce on it, pun intended, and some extra fix-ins. While he's telling him about it, I'm laughing at their facial expressions. They look like they're in heaven. I need to try this lemon pepper wing wet sauce because it sounds different. I've never had leopard pepper wings. I don't even know if we can get them here in Toronto, but if I'm ever in ATL, I need to have them. The way people go on about them, I need to try them. But what really got me about this scene, well, a lot of things got me about this scene, but really stood out to me about this scene was <laughs> was when the server is like, you're a real rapper. You're not one of those singing rappers like Fetty Wap. And I was thinking he was going to say Drake because back in 2016, Drake was popping. So I don't know if Donald Glover wasn't trying to show shots, throw shots so directly, but that was a funny moment, especially when he mentioned Tupac and Biggie. And that always opens the top five conversation. Who's your top five? I'm not letting you know, but I will say J. Cole is up there. He ain't number one, but he's up there. A lot of people swap out Tupac and Biggie with Jay-Z, Drake, Lil Wayne, Future? Really? Future? Come on, people. He's top five toxic. It's funny to see the shift and how different people identify with different things. Here's this server bigging up Paperboy for shooting this person, which from the opening scene of this episode, sounds like he didn't even do that because he said there's no victim. I don't mean, I don't know if that means he didn't kill him or he didn't hit him, but whatever it may be, it isn't what it seems. And what's so crazy to me was when the guy says at the end, you better not let me down because I don't know what I'll do if you do. I said, 
sir. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this scene, but there was so much happening. One of the most important things I actually had to voice to text to my phone, because if I didn't, I would butcher what Darius said. He always has the smoothest way of being esoteric with it. So he said, as I zoom in even more, he says, Humans are always so close to destruction. Life is a series of close calls. I mean, how would you know you were alive unless you knew you could die? I hope I said that right, because I'm trying to, every time I try to read it, it just scrolls around, so. He says it so calmly and smoothly while playing with condiments. That's Darius for you. But there's so much texture in that three lines. Talk about the times back then and now. Humans are so destructive. Look what's going on around the planet. We're always close calls. When you think about it, life is a series of close calls. You take a chance every single day in small and big ways. And I mean, how would you know you're alive unless you knew you could die? That is really speaking of the fragility of life itself, right? And a lot of people who feel most alive are the ones who've gone through near-death experiences, whether it be medical or based on where they grew up or natural disasters or whatever it may be. So there's just so much richness in those three sentences alone. I'll leave those lines and that scene where it is. Let's continue. So at one point, Paperboy goes to get gas. He's getting some weird vibes from the guy with the dreads who looks back at him to pay. I said, okay. He sees him talking to someone in the car. It doesn't even look spooky to me, but you know, Paperboy probably has a fifth sense that I don't because I'm not about that life. So he rolls off. I think Darius said he wanted to get something and he just rolls off. And then they're chilling at the house, kikiing. For some reason, Al goes out. He sees three kids recreating his crime scene. The little boy hits Deja or Asia or whatever her name. The parent comes out, cusses the three of them off. He tries to interject in the situation. Don't know why he did that. Like, mind the business that pays you. But I think he feels a little guilt because he is paper boy. And they don't even acknowledge him. They're like, paper boy who? He says it again. That's when the lady starts fixing up her hair. I said... It's the telling him that the two kids are not yours for me. She had to let him know, which for me was a whole side commentary on this idea that a woman's worth is in how many children she has before she sets herself up with a high value man. If you know about the manosphere, you know where I'm going here. So I thought that was so funny. She had to let him know that only one of them picnies is hers. She tells the kid, gives him back the gun she just snatched up to go get her phone so she could take pictures, a family picture, then a solo picture with her hand on her chest. When she put her hand on his chest, I was done. I was done. And then Paperboy comes back and he's like, I got her number. Darius hears a knock on the door. Someone wearing a Batman mask asks if Piper Boy lives there. He's so weirded out, but he says yes. And I was like, why did you say yes? And the guy runs off. Paper Boy comes to the door and Darius says, you're hot. And that's where the episode ends. Let's loop back to Ern's plot line. Ern's in the holding center and he's here for 98% of the episode. Things get real weird real quick. The first conversation he has, from what I remember, is with a man complaining in a very slowed mumbo rapper slurred speech. When I first watched this years ago, I said, that Atlanta accent is thick with two C's. But now I realize Homeboy was just lit lit. Like next level can't form a sentence lit. I try to put it together the same way Ern tried to. And all I got was he went somewhere after seeing someone after 11 years and now he's here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. What I didn't know was he was talking about homeboy sitting in front of him. So the guy turns around, I haven't seen you in 12 years. And he gives him the smoke and Ern just like, whoa. At one point, Ern goes to make his one call and he tells Van he loves her and please bail me out. It's the manipulation. I cannot Ern starts off so grimy. No wonder I put him up here by season three because look how low Donald Glover wrote that character. He is the epitome of a waste man. You couldn't tell the woman that you loved her when you're sleeping in her bed rent free, but you're gonna tell her that on the phone because you need to get out of a sticky situation. I'm not here for that. Ern goes to sit back down. He's happening to sit between two star-crossed lovers. He's like, can I move? And the guy's like, no. Are you uncomfortable? <laughs> I remember this being the funniest scene because it was so awkward and so unnecessary and it was so Donald Glover to me. So this guy's trying to holler at his long lost love and she's kind of playing him off wistfully. And then someone who needs to mind their business yells out, it's a man. And he says, no, it's not a man. Then the guy asks, well, if it's not a man, 
then why is she here where men are holded? There's so much context in this conversation about how the culture views transgendered people, how society back in 2016 views people, because I don't think we could have had that type of scene in 2022 if you ask me, but I think it needed to be done because I think a lot of people who don't normally have conversations about being gay or what it means to be on the spectrum, as Ern pointed out, it's just good to bring that to the culture, especially when the guy is like, well, I'm not gay because I only do that in here. Wait, what? Okay. If you like it, I love it. It's not my business anyway, so I don't care. Funny how someone can judge another person when they're in the same crappy situation. That escalated real quick. I was scared for her safety the first time I watched it. The second time I just laughed through it. But something I couldn't laugh through, I don't know if it was meant to be dark humor, but it just hurt it really hurt was when the mentally ill person was going around and everyone's like, oh, he's here every week. Oh yeah, he was here the last time I was here. And Ern's like, wait, what? He's obviously not well. And how everyone just seemed so blase, blase about this man who should be in a mental institute, not in a holding center weekly, laughing and kikiing. Even the correctional officers were making fun of him while he was drinking the toilet water until he spit on him. He pulled out the baton and the sounds of this obviously mentally unstable or psychologically inept person scream. It was just so painful, so saddening. And I don't, hmm, I think things have only gotten worse with that regard. I feel, and I might be wrong, that when it comes to LGBTQ+, there's been more understanding and more conversation. But when it comes to when it comes to mental health in the community or the culture's views or societal's views or how these people get pumped into the wrong thing when they should go to programming, there needs to be more conversation there. And even aside from that, just knowing what's happened and what's been captured by social media, that stuff has always been there. It's just in front of our eyes all the time. Look how many things have happened in the last five years that have been so similar to that type of escalation. It's just, it's very saddening. Enough depressing stuff. That's all I gotta say about that scene because I feel like some things change and some things don't. The next part that really had me was when there was another scene with Ern. I might be forgetting another conversation, so if I am, let me know down below. But the next scene that I remember is Ern getting called up and being so eager, like, E marks, that's me, that's me. He goes out and Van is in the car not having no parts of it. He's trying to joke and it's really not the time for that. He's telling her that Lottie's not gonna remember the time that daddy went to jail. She tells him to shut up and she drives off and that's the end of it for him. This scene really embodies and symbolizes his lack of concern for how Van feels. He never once checked in to see how she was, where the money came from, if she had it, you know, having to wake up Lottie and bring her there. Like, it's just so inconsiderate. I just, yeah. <laughs> Earn did not start off on the right foot for me. And I'm starting to feel those feelings again. Even knowing where he ends up is not a good look. So I, I really love this episode. It was dark in so many ways, but it was also super hilarious in others. I would say this episode was even better than the first one, just because it really poured into so many conversations about what's happening in the world, even present day. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I'd love to hear yours, so leave them down for me below. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.